but what is that relationship between the real world and the work of the scholar? I mean, is that something specifically of interest to you? It, I mean, yes, it is of interest to me, partially because I don't know that for me they're separate. Right. Um, right. You know, my real world does involve artists. And in fact, that's how I met Pamela. Right. Um, I met Pamela because an artist that, with whom I have worked really very closely um, and with whom she has been very interested in for a long time, Frank Bowling, who's represented in the book, um, he kept saying to me, there is this woman that you have to meet. And I would say, could we just talk about your work and just get through that, you know, we'd have work to do here. And he would say, no, 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 there's someone you have to meet. There's someone you have to meet. And finally we met and then I could understand what he was talking about because I think for him and for many other artists, I think Sam Gilliam is one, I think Jack Whitten is another, I think Mark Bradford is like that as well. Pamela has had real conversations with them that go beyond the patron artist, collector artist relationship into the realm of aesthetics, mm -hmm. um, into the realm of their own social and personal lives that are, I don't know if you can see this in the book. I hope you can feel it when you read the book that there is not a single person who is living in the book with whom Pamela and Fred have not made an effort to connect and with whom they have not been mm -hmm. successful connecting with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So it's reverting to this theme of artists, there's, a, there's this concept that I think has become codified for us as Katie and I have discussed the show. Um, so it, one way of putting it would be it's about history and it's about artists, of course, but it's not really a history that we had to write or invent, but rather a history that the artists were writing for themselves and that we are simply unfurling. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting, almost brilliant concept, mm -hmm. not generated by us, but given, um, in part as a consequence of this collection. So I would love for you to comment on that and how it becomes manifest in the show. So. So I guess because now you've put this in my mind, Courtney. Sorry. No, no, but it's it's true. And I think, well, what you know, what did that early training have to do? And it it was with where we ended up. And it was so good. It's such a good start. For, but for me, graduate school was not such a great follow up. You know, I came out into a world um, of art that I an account of art I didn't recognize. That was entirely theoretical, that was very narrow, that had only room for 10 artists, you know, like Robert Smithson and a few other people who were anointed. And it just didn't bear any resemblance to the world I knew. There weren't many women in it. There were no people of color in it. There wasn't a lot of materialist art making, hand, hand making. Um, and so um, art historians weren't doing such a good job. You know, and you saw the same kind of art over and over again in museums. So to think about how do you, I had this idea, another history is possible, and it's an essay I wrote about a lot of these older artists um, about 10 years ago, it was called that, but to how do you imagine it? And I think it's always smarter to listen to artists than to try and make something up on your own. And I didn't have older models, you know, I think between Ellen Johnson and our generation, there's a big hole. Huge gap. Yes, so I started out listening. I think some of the same way that Pamela started listening, not just to Lowry Sims, who's an older curator, but to Richard Mayhew, who's an important older artist, um, and a huge part of the collection that's not represented in this smaller exhibition, but who's very much a touchstone in the book. Um, so listening to artists, talking to artists, and realizing that the artists had made this history for themselves, and artists make history in two ways. They make history by doing new things, things that haven't been done before, and they make their own history um, by making their own connections to other artists. So a lot of artists in the exhibition, Norman Lewis is the touchstone for them. And that's why the exhibition, and Pamela, I think intuited this from almost the very beginning, and Fred, that, I'm sorry to keep saying and Fred, um, but yes, Pamela and Fred intuited that um, Norman Lewis was the place to start. And he was a gift of cosmic proportions, as someone says in the book. Jack Witten, Mel Edwards, people whom he directly mentored, but then also an emblem for, for younger artists who never had the chance to meet him. So the history is made in both those ways. And I don't know, I've always wanted to ask Courtney, is that, did you, how much did you know that from the beginning? Because the book has that title, Four mm -hmm. Generations. Well, let me, let me go back. So. Mm -hmm. The real reason that I first started coming to New Orleans was because my parents would take me to the Bayou Classic. 
Um, and for those of you who are wondering what's a Bayou Classic, you should find out. Um, we did so because we were very involved um, with the historically black colleges and universities that exist all over our countries. More existed in the 80s than that, that do now. Mm -hmm. There are still many that are vibrant. Most of those schools had art and art history programs. And so, in many ways, one of the reasons that I knew that I could be an art historian or that I wanted to be one was because of those who had come from Fisk, um, those who were at Howard, which still has an amazing art history program. Mm -hmm. um, so, in some ways, Hearing, going to Oberlin and to other places and going to graduate school at Yale, which was amazing, and seeing artists across the street, it, it never bothered me to not hear people talk about the people that I knew they existed because I so firmly already knew they existed. Mm -hmm. I knew that the art history, I am not reinventing the wheel by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. Much of the material that I write about have, I am citing other people as I do that work, and I'm citing them because I think that they need to be known in a wider frame. And so, yes, the artists have done an amazing amount to make themselves visible, but there were, you know, there's a parallel art history that went along with mm -hmm. them. People like James Porter, um, mm -hmm. with whom, I think for whom a book like this would not be possible without. Mm -hmm. So, it's funny that, that education put you off, in some ways, I felt like I wanted to be even more of an art historian every time someone told me that, you know, I couldn't write about M Martin Puryear as a land artist because they'd never heard of him. And I think, well, you know, stupid you, um, because that work exists, you know? Um, so it, it, in, in many ways, I would say, strangely enough, that art history made me political um, because I wanted to be able to explain the full history as opposed to the part yes. that I felt like I was being taught. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, can I ask then, this is a follow-up, how are you going to make those various convictions manifest in your role at DIA? And I know you probably can't describe, you know, two or three years of programming the exhibitions, but just <laughs> in, pr in principle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, nobody's recording, hear. actually yeah. everybody's recording this. <laughs> so, but just, in, but just in principle, how, how, how will that become manifest as part of the identity of that institution? So, the DIA Art Foundation, um, as an office, but also as a kind of conceptual space, lives on 22nd Street. Our offices are still on 22nd Street in New York between 10th and 11th. Please come by. Um, but on 22nd Street is where DIA was actually founded as the institution that will then grow to become a larger thing. Um, I was at work yesterday trying to figure out uh, many things, and I happened to take a break and walk across the street to an unnamed gallery. That unnamed gallery has a major bookstore on its first floor in what used to be the DIA Art Center um, and, until about 2002. Sitting on the desk as someone was about to purchase two copies was four generations. Mm. And I swear to you, this happened. And I walked in and I said, you don't know how good you've got it. Like, that book is amazing. And they looked at me like I was completely <laughs> crazy. And the guy who's behind the counter is laughing because he knows that I'm making you know, fun of this moment, but I'm also thinking to myself, well, you've done it. Like, this has already happened. This show is here. This book is out in the world. You know, when in the world were you going to walk into a blue chip gallery and see something like that for sale by someone who clearly has no other relationship with that work except for what they will get out of this book, and then they will go and see the exhibition, and then they will know this entire body of artworks. Mm -hmm. So, in some ways, it's not so much what do I have to do, it's what have we already been doing, mm -hmm. and how do we keep up that work? Mm -hmm. um, I know that skates by your question of what will I do at DIA, um, but I will tell you this, I will keep doing what I've done, yeah. um, which is teach a whole, right. not a part. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. Yeah, right. Okay. So, um, we don't have terribly much time because I do want to open this up to the audience, but um, just to return to the exhibition briefly. The title, um, beautiful, I think it's a very beautiful title. Not by me. Slight, no, slightly Stolen. opaque um, yes. to some, but, but I think when unpacked, really illuminates the show in an unusual way. I think often exhibition titles are simply window dressing. In this case, if you take those two words apart and apply them to the show, you begin to understand its structure. Mm -hmm. So um, just in advance of everybody going upstairs and enjoying, maybe you mm -hmm. could say a little bit about those two words. So I just say artists hate group shows often for a reason because they feel like they're being recruited into something that they didn't sign, volunteer for, you know, which is the bright idea of some curator. All your work is about lawnmowers, or all this work is about red beans and rice when they come to New Orleans, or whatever it is. 
And so it's worse in the case of people who have some, some kind of social identity that seems different, like women, Latin American artists, black artists, which the, the group shows are very, this is what black artists do. You know, not all 14 channels, like Mark Bradford likes to say of blackness, but here's some generalization. So I wanted to talk about that pull that artists have, that African American artists have between historically, starting maybe with Norman Lewis, and that's part of the reason he's a touchstone, between wanting to be totally free, autonomous, have his own style, be as free as Jackson Pollock, um, on the one hand, and the other hand, feeling a pressure to represent his racial identity, both from the mainstream um, and from within the black community, to somehow represent that in a representational, legible way. And so that theme continues on throughout generations of artists, um, for people like Glenn Ligon to say, what, what is the message? You know, I have to have a message. Um, it's a special on these artists who seem um, other to the mainstream. So the title is stolen from Edouard Glissant, who's a beautiful writer and a theorist, theorist um, and he has this phrase, solidary and solitary, not, have to, not to have to choose between a group identity, freely chosen, perhaps, you know, chosen affinities, connections that the artists make, and those are the duets upstairs, and the solitary, the ability to be totally one's, uh, oneself, to make one's own mistakes, as Norman Lewis said it. And then, um, when we were about to go to press, poor Miko, I found out Elizabeth Catlett had already come across this, you know, had used this formulation herself in 1985, and so we squeezed it into the, the footnotes, but they, they said it more beautifully than I could. So. It's wonderful. So I think that's a really lovely note to end on, especially as we're going to progress upstairs and see the show.